We are in the first part of the afternoon, and the title of the panel is Land, Water, Food, and Sustainability. The panelists are Stephanie Foote from West Virginia University, Jeremy Jackson from Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Smithsonian Institution, Tom Linden from the University of North Carolina School of Media and Journalism, and our moderator to my right here is Matthew Booker from North Carolina State University. We are live streaming the entire event. We will have time in each of these panels for lots of discussion and questions from the audience. The only thing we ask is that you wait for the microphone. We will run a microphone to you if you raise your hand, that you ask the questions with the microphone so we can also capture what you all want to say. Please join me in welcoming the first panel. Uh, so I'm an environmental historian. I'm Matthew Booker. I'm an environmental historian, and I direct the Science, Technology, and Society program at NC State University down the road. And so our plan is to have each of our speakers use 15 minutes to talk about whatever they will on our, our topic of land, water, food, and sustainability. And you know, that topic pretty much covers everything, everywhere, always. So we have room to run for our panelists. Um, Tanya gave very nice brief introductions, but I just want to say something about each of our panelists before starting with Stephanie, who will have 15 minutes. Then we'll move to Jeremy and finally uh, Tom. So Stephanie, as you heard, is an academic. She's a professor of English. She's an environmental humanist as well, an author of four books. She's founder and editor of the journal Resilience, a journal of the environmental humanities, and I admire her very much. Um, she works on waste, or at least that's one of the things she thinks about. And Stephanie's work gets at what I think of as maybe the most destructive and remarkable intellectual achievement of the 19th and 20th centuries, which is the idea of a way, where you send your waste. Soils to bury our garbage become landfills, rivers, lakes, and oceans to pour our human waste and our industrial effluents. Even the atmosphere, the ultimate sink for our species, remarkable innovation, burning the stored carbon of ancient life. So when Stephanie thinks about how people relate to waste and to garbage, what we call garbage and how we relate to it, she's addressing a central component of our environmental crises and perhaps also our, our social crises. So welcome to Stephanie. You don't, you don't have to start now because I'm gonna introduce Jeremy and then Tom and then we'll turn it back over to you. How's that? <laughs> I believe you that you would go for a walk if I let you. Um, next alphabetically and to my right is Jeremy Jackson who's just reminded me that his, his biography in our, um, in our handout is a little off. He has at least two though of the job titles, the full-time job titles that are listed in our program. Jeremy is, among other things, and I say that because I've read your historical ecology work and it profoundly changed my trajectory as a scholar. Among other things, he is a world expert on corals. And corals are one of the quiet heroes of the world. I was going to say of the Holocene period, but Jeremy just pointed out to me that in the South Pacific, there are corals that are at least 30 million years old. 30 million years of corals in the same place. So that's a lot more than the Holocene. <laughs> They've been colonizing the continental shelves and these volcanic eruptions worldwide, calming waves, providing food and homes for vast numbers of diverse species of marine plants and animals. And they become the proverbial canary in the coal mine for global warming. As we heard last night, Climate change is not the only problem, though. And corals can really remind us of that. In a 2014 article, From Despair to Repair, Protecting Parrotfish Can Help Back Caribbean Coral Reefs, Jeremy noted that many people say that climate change has already doomed coral, coral reefs. But the loss of parrotfishes and other seaweed-eating grazers has been far more important than climate change for Caribbean reef destruction so far. While it is true that climate change poses an enormous risk for the future because of coral bleaching and more acidic oceans, the fact is that reefs protected from overfishing, excessive coastal development, and pollution are more resilient to these stresses. So this is the kind of insight that Jeremy brings after a lifetime of 
ecological work, but also often and frequently with an eye to history and to the communities upon which, uh, which depend upon those oceans and those corals. So welcome, Jeremy. Finally, and definitely not least, is my colleague over at the University of North Carolina, Tom Linden. He's a distinguished professor of medical journalism, where he directs the Medical and Science Journalism Master's Program. But that is a very poor introduction, I must say, Tom, to the variety of work that you do. He's been a television reporter, a news anchor, and a longtime teacher of better science journalism. On his faculty page, Tom says, his mission is to train science and medical reporters to work across all media platforms to better communicate with the public on a variety of medical science and environmental issues. One of the greatest challenges we face is communicating the gravity of environmental threats while not overdoing it and finding ways to motivate while not giving in to apocalyptic messages of despair. That's from me. And I would say that Tom is at the front line of that effort because of the hundreds of students who go through his courses and his program, both graduate and undergraduate. So welcome, Tom. So Stephanie, now you get your 15 minutes. Okay. Is this on? Good. OK. Um, thank you to National Humanities Center for having me back. And for those of you who are fellows now, it still exists after you leave, which was a hard lesson to learn. <laughs> um, I am working on a book, which I optimistically say I'm finishing this spring, about garbage and waste. Um, and following the tracks of its subject, its topic seems to be proliferating and growing. And in its draft form, it is something like a midden heap of every idea that I've ever had or anyone has ever had about garbage. My argument is that garbage is the category and the object that allows us to fully see the workings of our problems with agency and materiality, both at the smallest and the largest scales. Coiled in every piece of garbage is the history of an object at various stages of its life, how it has been made and loved, used and discarded, circulated and immobilized, bought and sold, and how it has traveled through networks of distribution and commerce, how its value has been attributed and then drained. Although my goal was to write about garbage, I found myself, like many another who has come before me, insisting on the suppleness of language about garbage, trying to exploit what seemed to me a fascinating tension between refuse as an object and refusal as a practice, or the tension between the scarcity signaled by wasted time, people, and objects, and the richness that is signified by the luxury that underwrites practices of waste, especially in the um, rich world. I also found myself drawn to an almost statistical way of thinking about garbage. How much garbage does the average person make? How much does the US make monetarily when it exports its garbage? What's in municipal waste? Who picks it up? Where does it go? Where's the money, pound for pound? How many bodies are damaged by exposure to the waste generated by capitalism, by industrialization, by consumerism? How is that waste sponsored by the people who mine, manufacture, and dispose of the raw material that make the products that rich world consumers purchase? What bodies are materialized and dematerialized around garbage? The sort of toggling back and forth I experience while I study waste is not atypical in the field. There is a field called discard studies, I was sort of surprised to know, full of people exactly like me. Um, and partially this is because waste and garbage are not easy to categorize. The terms I use seem to bleed into one another, and yet they all mean different things, especially to experts in municipal solid waste. The language of garbage is important, and it's very precise. Although I tell people the book is about garbage and waste, it's really about a particular kind of garbage, and that is municipal solid waste. It's not about landfill leachate, or radioactive waste, or post-industrial waste, nor is it about the waste generated by the manufacture of goods. It is about that most common sort of waste, the broken or lost object that once satisfied a need and that a human hand deliberately touched and then threw away. Gay Hawkins, who is a wonderful um, theorist, writes, quote, the simplest definition of waste is discarded, expelled, or excess matter. But she goes on to argue that such a plain definition does not get close to the minefield of emotions and moral anxieties that waste can provoke. That's her language. Her book is organized around different objects, plastic bags or even um, human waste, for example, and beautifully argues that the study of garbage is critical for the humanities 
in part because in order to release waste from being a strictly moral issue, we must understand it as a productive category that organizes individual habits and ethical choices. If waste is that which is not us, therefore we must consider it in its full materiality as well as ideological senses, understanding that in its incarnation as garbage or rubbish, it enmeshes us in the world. This is the kind of garbage about which a decision has been made. It is the kind of garbage that more than one person has touched and that has poisoned more than one person. That kind of garbage is the most visible. It's the kind of garbage that you see on the streets. It's the kind of garbage that is perhaps the most visible sign of how humans have caused environmental degradation. Not surprisingly, a lot of public attention is paid to it. It assaults our senses. It's rancid and putrefying, it's damaged and useless, or it's just jarringly out of place. But it's also easy to ignore. The objects we get rid of haunt and structure our relationships, not just to the things we use and waste, but to the things we keep and treasure. The detritus of everyday life is what I'm interested in, and it's minor daily moments of horrifying grace, because I believe that they offer us the richest and most concentrated text of the Anthropocene. In it, we can trace the histories of the global and local circulation and transformation of raw material and the human costs of making, using, and discarding commodities. But more, we can trace the intense anxiety about personal responsibility toward environmental catastrophe that has become the hallmark of contemporary American life. It is a global catastrophe accessed through the most characteristic forms of those ragged epiphanies in the rich world, anxiety about things. Those things are both our despair and our hope at once. Literary and cultural narratives in the 20th century love the idea of garbage. They love to think about the breakdown of modern life as an allegory of being lost in a tide of things. Literary theories renewed attention to things, especially to objects out of place, also asks us to see material like garbage as the bearer of an historical narrative about ecological devastation. So for me and for this book, the story that Garbage tells is a story about the value of the environmental humanities as a field. It has, that field is on the one hand concerned with the humanities role in addressing political change and social justice, and on the other is fascinated with the promise of how materiality and object-oriented ontology, for example, can break a kind of post-structuralist script that governs the relationship between textuality and quote unquote real world climate change. So I'm trying to thread the needle of new and historical materialism by proposing that garbage demands that we address the very moment when an object's full meaning withdraws from us and invites us to consider why in this moment we hunger as much for a new way to think about our garbage as we seem to hunger for new things. One of the things that troubles my um, ability to finish this book, though, is not the abstract or the real. It's that the trade in garbage is enormous and it's global. So I keep finding myself pushed to this other way of thinking about garbage. You probably all know this, but you know I have the microphone, so I'm not going to stop talking. The trade in garbage is um, it's. It's a huge part of the GDP of this country and most other countries. It's very mobile. It's as mobile as the commodity, in part because garbage is a commodity. The emergence of the shipping container, you probably all know, makes no distinction between garbage and new commodities, is the emblem of that mobility. Um, Vivian Thompson, who is a really good uh, theorist of how garbage travels, has written in her study that five billion tons of non-wastewater waste are generated in the US every year an amount that includes 214 million tons of non-hazardous industrial waste. And she reminds us that household hazardous waste exemptions allow us to throw out materials that if thrown out by industry would count as hazardous waste. So in our households, the garbage we produce is, if an industry threw it away, hazardous waste. So over 80% of non-recycled and composted municipal solid waste is landfilled in the US. The rest is burned or buried. Uh, ash from these plants is also landfilled. The rest, what we cannot burn or that we believe we are recycling, is exported, where it is dumped in nations without a municipal garbage infrastructure. Um, it pollutes water, land, and bodies. I think I've hit the three subjects and food of this panel. 
um, and it relies on highly formalized scavenging economies that exacerbate global inequalities. So when I discuss garbage, usually the one thing people ask me about is recycling. Um, and I have something written here, but I might as well just say hollow laughter. Uh, you have probably been following the news. Um, recycling has been the emblem of hope for so long for so many people, even though historically only a very tiny fraction of municipal solid waste was ever recovered for recycling. Um, the EPA, which is still a very fine organization, if it can keep its website up under the current administration, please live stream that, estimates that every person in the U.S. generates around four and a half pounds of municipal solid waste a day, um, including paper and yard waste, a figure that does not include the waste generated to produce the objects we buy and throw away. So it's not taking into account manufacture. Um, it's a low estimate. That's a very low estimate. But people have really believed in recycling, especially of plastics. And the truth is that the recycling of plastics, of which there are thousands of varieties, never exceeded 10%. Um, the most recycled material is corrugated cardboard and yard waste. Um, and the easiest way to do that is by composting them along with food. Individual composting is efficient, and so are municipal programs um, that account for nearly a quarter of what we throw away, food. Now most people know the story about what we do with our recycling. If you ever get a chance to look at the trade papers in the waste industry, I recommend very highly checking out a news aggregator called Waste Dive. Um, and an excellent trash collective called Discard Studies. You'll see that they have been following the news from China for a number of years and uh, understood that it would be restricting recycling for which it has been our primary buyer since before 2017 when China first started making arguments that it was going to restrict that. Now the Times and the Post and the Guardian have reported the story about the commerce and the travel of our recycling, and now local municipalities are considering stopping or have stopped recycling such things as plastic. It feels, again, like we are going to drown in our own waste. Um, I haven't gotten to the hope part yet, and I only have a few minutes left, so I'll tell you what I think the hope part is. I think the hope part in this crisis of garbage and recycling is that we have lost our faith that there is a magical solution to this problem. There isn't one, and that makes me very hopeful, that we no longer think that simply by exporting or offloading garbage, we can stop attending to the very serious crisis of why we believe in objects without believing that they have a long life that will haunt us no matter where they go. I find it hopeful that more and more people are thinking about where our commodities are, and so I'll, I will also make a pitch for the fact that one of the projects I'm doing this year that was really inspired by last year, one minute, oh, it's such a good project, I wish I had time to tell you about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
taught me more than an entire year of studying coral reefs could do. Um, we thought of them as pristine, even though there weren't any fish, but we didn't make the connection. And we were not alone. Around the world, the new science of marine ecology was studying the ocean world as if it were pristine, sort of naively ignoring the evidence that lay in front of us. Um, and so therefore treating them as natural systems. My own work was focused on the wonderful complexity of interactions for space on coral reefs. You, you look at a photograph of a coral reef and it's beautiful and tranquil, but really it's, it's nature red and tooth and claw and 100% of the space is occupied. So if one thing gets bigger, something else gets smaller. And I looked at the sort of hierarchy of interactions of dominance and discovered that, in fact, it wasn't a, a Western hierarchy, it was a network. So, for example, A would beat B, B would beat C, C would beat A. So C, C down the line, A beats B, B beats C, but C beats A and comes around, sort of like, you know, catching the tail. And that this was this mechanism of the maintenance of diversity, and that was hugely controversial, and it was a lot of fun, and I got tenure, you know, because of that. So, and, and my students and I, we built a picture of how coral reefs work, and we, were really, we thought we were the bee's knees, and it was really great. And then there was a hurricane in 1980, Hurricane Allen, the, at the time, third strongest hurricane ever strike the Atlantic. I took half the lab up into my house, and we rode out the storm, and we came down, and we looked at the remains. You could smell the death of the coral reef from all the... There were new islands of what were coral and whatever. But we were really smart. We really understood what was going on. Hurricanes had happened before. We wrote this really hot paper, published it in Science, and we predicted exactly the way the coral reefs were going to recover, and they didn't. And that not recovering was the light bulb going off for me that we had changed the rules. Nobody had talked about Anthropocene, but that was Anthropocene. There were no coral reefs that were pristine. There were no coral reefs that could function the way they did. Um, and this is this problem of shifting baselines, which I think is the crucial impediment to understanding. Um, I like to describe it this way. Everybody thinks natural is the way the world was when they were 15. Unnatural is the way the world is when you're 76, like me, which is why I'm a lot more depressing than the younger people who are up there. But since we all know children never listen to their parents, they make the exact same mistake. And so generation by generation, we lose all concept of what the natural world was like. OK, so um, things uh, just kept going on and on and kept getting worse and worse. I did an oil spill study I'm very proud of, um, of a big oil spill that occurred in Panama. And, um, and as a result of that spill, um, we stopped oil drilling on the west coast of Florida, which has still not been allowed. But it was really creepy because we had, you know, you don't plan an oil spill, so we had, we had control reefs and the oiled reefs. And then the year after we published our big paper in science, all the control reefs died. And they died because of disease and they died of all these other things that were going on apart from climate change that um, we've just been ignoring. So that led me to dig into the science of what I call ocean apocalypse. And I wrote a couple of papers. The first was called Reef Since Columbus to show uh, people uh, what the Caribbean was like in 1492. It's an amazing, amazing story. And then I wrote a paper about overfishing, and that went viral. And um, the fishing industry ganged up on me, and they, they, I, I will proudly say there is a hate Jeremy Jackson website, which is still up somewhere, about um, overfishing. So I went on the road, and I gave w over 100 public lectures in a period of about four or five years talking about this destruction in the oceans. And I will say that we, we sort of won. We actually changed, uh, Steve Rohde sitting there I can tell you that we actually changed NOAA policy and the Magnuson-Stevens Act was rewritten in a way that reflected on some of this. But, you know, it's still really screwed up. And, and 
And if you want to really get depressed sometime, watch my TED talk, How We Wreck the Oceans, because it'll drive you to drink. And, and it, it sort of describes my state of mind doing this because, you know, it was a mix of despair and anger and frustration um, about stuff I loved because, you know, I started studying coral reefs in the ocean because I love their beauty and they fascinate me. And I don't scuba dive anymore because for me, scuba diving is like visiting a morgue. I mean, it's, it's, it's the concentration camp of the oceans to go to a coral reef today, except for a few very isolated places. But what the hell do you do after all that anger? You know, I mean, um, I, I, I don't think I'm brain dead yet. And, and so I, I try to think about what is useful because it doesn't do any good to just keep rehashing all the destruction and the doom and the gloom. And, and so for me, um, that has involved a fundamental reevaluation of what the ocean is and what it means to humanity as a resource, but also what it means to us as a way of life and all the cultures that have evolved around the oceans. And then for me personally, sort of what do I do with the rest of what I'm doing? So I'm deeply involved in a lot of the, the science of it all. These things called marine protected areas that um, in fact don't exclude the people. Right? Successful marine protected areas keep the original people and don't let anybody else in. They really work. And it's an amazing scientific fact that if you do not kill all the fish, there will be more fish. Now that is, you know, sort of obvious, but I want you to know that millions of dollars of National Science Foundation money were spent to demonstrate that that's actually true. And that's a measure of the pushback of the fishing industry that has been fighting this notion of protected areas for obvious reasons. There are holy places in the ocean, Bermuda, Bonaire, Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, places where people saw what was happening to their resources and their reefs, and they actually intervened and they did something about it, and they are beautiful, and, and they are a testimony um, to, to what can be achieved. Um, there are other sort of examples of this. There's this amazing paper that was published in Nature um, just a year ago about rats on islands. Because, you know, one of the blessings of European colonization is rats. And, and a very great coral reef biologist observed that when he went to islands that had rats, um, they seemed to have really sick coral reefs. And when he went to islands that didn't have rats, they had comparatively speaking, really beautiful coral reefs. And so he turned it into a deep scientific study. And he looked at the flow of carbon and nitrogen and all this stuff. And what he showed, well, you know, the rats kill the birds. What are the seabirds? Seabirds are these concentration of bird shit machines that bring this all the productivity for a thousand miles around and poop it on wherever they, it is they nest. And this stuff gives nutrients to the water and the reefs grow and blah, blah, blah. And it's just this amazing story. So there are all these examples. And then before I run out of time, I want to say that amazingly, I think we're going to close down the high seas. I think it's actually going to happen in the United Nations that we will close down the high seas as the territory of humanity and one of the amazing things that this will accomplish is it will equalize ocean resources because only a few countries can afford to go out and rape and pillage the high seas in the middle of the ocean. If you stop that and the high seas become a nursery and a safe haven for fish, then all around the rim of the bathtub, there will be more that we can exploit. So there's a lot of stuff that's working. It really is working. Business as usual is dead. I think that's something as bad as the news is. We should remember that things really are changing. Um, but I think we still haven't arrived at the most important thing, which is the reevaluation of ourselves. We're treating these things like recycling. We're treating these things as something that we can somehow magically fix, but we're not looking in the mirror. And just like recycling and waste is this fundamental reflection of our cultural values, 
the same is the, the same is true of everything to do with the health of ocean ecosystems and all the rest. And and a fascinating thing is happening. You know, Carl Safina wrote The Eye of the Albatross, and he anthropomorphized Amelia, as in Amelia Earhart, and because she's tagged, and she flies for 7,000 miles to get food, it does it in a week, comes back, regurgitates it, and 15 minutes later, takes off again. So we now have lots of Amelias, and the amazing Barbara Block at Stanford is tagging, tagging white sharks and tuna. She has a site, go to the web, the White Shark Cafe, where you can see names, something like 80 great white sharks, and where they've gone, and what they've been doing, and whether they, you know, gave birth. I mean, just amazing, amazing stuff. So um, I think I, I just want to end with the statement that um, it's become obvious to me just in my own personal journey that the only way we really have any hope of changing our relationship to the ocean is to do it very fundamentally in terms of self-reflection about how we view it, what we value for it, um, thinking about those individual animals and, and thinking about them coming to realize something mag magical about their own lives, and, and, and I think maybe that'll do. But at any rate, it's what keeps me from going to drink. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Tom, you're up. I feel really humbled talking after Stephanie and Jeremy, two great scholars. I, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I am a professor, but I'm not a scholar. I teach and I practice, uh, and those are my, my strengths, and, and that, those are the areas from which I'll speak. Uh, so when I thought about what to title this talk, I thought, beyond despair, hopelessness. I thought, maybe that's what I'm thinking. And um, I hope not. I hope that's not it. But that was my first impulse as a journalist, as I see what's happening around me. Um, let me just first start off with a great interview I just came across in uh, Orion Magazine with Wendell Berry, whom many of you are probably familiar with, the essayist and farmer, long time. Uh, resident farmer uh, from Kentucky. And uh, he, he said in this interview in Orion Magazine that uh, I believe it's still online, he said, the issue there again, it seems to me, is the acceptance of a limit. Science that accepts limits would do no harm to an ecosystem or a human body. This is very different from the kind of science that too frequently turns out to be product development without control of its application. Then he goes on to say, the global economy is almost by definition not subject to regulation, and this simply means that corporations can pursue economic advantage without limit. Wherever in the world these advantages are to be found, and as I've thought of it in the last several years, and he's, he's in his 80s now, it has seemed to me that we've had a global economy for about 500 years ever since the time of Columbus. And this allowed us to think that if we don't have some necessity of life here, we can get it from somewhere else. This is the most damaging idea that we've ever had. It's still with us, still current, and it still, it still excuses local plunder and theft and, ex and enslavement. And I, I, think, I think he hit it right on the head, that it's exploitation, it's extraction, as we heard this morning, of our natural resources. That is killing human life as we perhaps would like it to be and hurting the planet. It's a never-ending extraction of natural resources. In other words, not regenerating the Earth as the, the Duke uh, 
uh, farm is trying to do, and, and as they talked about it, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket what they're doing in terms of raising the, uh, increasing the amount of, of um, soil, but it's, it's the extraction of natural resources, first and foremost, fossil fuels. So as a journalist, the question always is, and as a science journalist, and I started out as a medical journalist since I'm a, a physician by training, I think it's really important to try to conceptualize what makes science news. And you probably all have your own ideas, uh, and, and you may wonder why are science reporters uh, reporting on whatever they choose to report on. Well, uh, Boyce Rensberger, who was the longtime science editor of the Washington Post and then headed the MIT Science Journalism Program, uh, wrote an article uh, many years ago that, uh, that I uh, really value, and I think he hit, it, hit the nail on the head. So here are his five criteria for what makes science news. First and foremost, not necessarily in this order actually, not foremost, first is fascination value. In other words, is something just inherently interesting? So I would say cosmology stories would, would hit that point. Not a lot of great application at the beginning, or if at all, but just satisfies our curiosity. The human mind wants to find out what the human mind doesn't already know. On the opposite end of the spectrum is size of the natural audience. And the best example I can give of that are stories about the common cold. Everybody gets a common cold, and most everybody is interested in reading about it <laughs> or seeing stories about it. So that's, that's another criterion for what makes science news. Well, skip number three, importance. So importance is an important discovery, and discovery of HIV, of the human genome, of penicillin. Uh, if you ever see the word breakthrough in a science story, uh, it's probably a bad science writer who wrote that story, or a bad writer, because there are very, very, very few breakthroughs, as you all know, in science, especially in medical science, maybe once every 25 years. Maybe the last one was uh, identification of HIV, or before that, the uh, discovery of the human genome. Reliability of the results. This is really important. And uh, when results are reliable, for example, the uh, human effect, human uh, caused uh, reasons for climate change, that to me is a hurdle that's been jumped. And we don't need to have a he said, she said, or on the other hand, a comment in every story which was the case in stories about climate change up to uh, maybe uh, five, 10 years ago. And then there's timeliness. And that's a complete, completely subjective criterion, but uh, just to put it in the popular mode, if, if a prominent individual has a sudden heart attack, suddenly that's timely as far as the uh, news cycle is concerned. And I would say climate change is timely now. So uh, when we make a story, when we do a story, whether it's uh, whatever medium, print or broadcast or audio or radio, uh, I like to think of John Franklin's definition of story. John Franklin won two Pulitzer Prizes, wrote a great book called Writing for Story. He used to write for the NNO for a while, uh, Portland, Oregonian, and then taught at uh, the University of Maryland. And, and I love his definition. A story consists of a sequence of actions that occur when a sympathetic character encounters a complicating situation that he, and he wrote this in 88, so excuse the gender bias, he or she confronts and solves. And then he had a simple story structure. A compelling story should start with a complication. That's what makes you interested in the story. And then a longer story might have development one, two, three, and four and five, resolution. Uh, so clearly, Franklin stole this from Shakespeare, right? We know that. Act one, two, three, four, five. And he actually does mention Shakespeare uh, in his book. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't total theft uh, at all. 
Uh, and here are some storytelling tips that uh, Franklin uh, wrote about and I share with my students. Show your story rather than tell how it happened. And this for any of you who are interested in writing for the popular media, I think are, th these are very good piece of advice. To evoke emotion, show actions by characters rather than tell us how those characters feel. So we always want to see characters in a story, whether it's a 900-word uh, story or a, a long narrative. We want to see actions. We don't want to see a lot of uh, internal thought processes. Choose a story and stick with it. In other words, don't have two or three different stories going on at the same time. Be clear. It's not the storyteller's function to portray the confusion of life. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, those are his storytelling tips. I recently had a visitor come to my class who was a longtime executive for a major uh, news organization in the United States. And uh, his, his company did an interesting study uh, about what he called completion rate. And completion rate, they charted online, because you can do that online. Uh, what were, and these were video stories, how long individuals stayed with a particular story. And these were typically three, two, three, maybe four minute stories. And he found out, the organization found out, that completion rate really depended on the following criteria the following uh, uh, factors. First, the story had to have a focus. It had to have a strong character, had to have a hook, and it had to speak to the heart. And our uh, uh, plenary speaker yesterday hit that point really well. It has to be a heartfelt story, otherwise a uh, listener, viewer, reader or will not stick with it. So here's the challenge of science journalists in my mind, to seek truth and report it to minimize harm, act independently, to be accountable. And the role, as, as be, has been mentioned before by others, is to provide a bridge between the scientific world and the community. That's the role of the science, uh, science journalists. And to translate complex jargon into plain language and to put scientific issues uh, in perspective. So I'm going to skip through a couple things here. Uh, there, there was a survey done last year by George Mason, Mason University's Center uh, for Climate Change Communication, and Ed Maybeck was the main, uh, was the lead author uh, of this study. And they surveyed uh, more than 1,200 members of the Society of Professional Journalists, and they had a participation rate of, of nearly half, which was quite good. Uh, and these are roles that journalists serve through their work. I don't think you can read all these things, but just about between 98 and 100 percent of all of these categories science journalists thought were important, reporting the facts, informing the public, exposing social problems, holding <clears throat> people, organizations accountable, and educating the public. So these were all uh, key roles that science journalists uh, showed. But if they had to identify what they thought were their most was their most important role, number one was informing and raising awareness about relevant developments and issues, and close behind it was reporting the facts. Three percent, way down below, was exposing social problems, and then kind of in the middle ground was holding organizations accountable and educating the public. And then also as part of the survey, and you can, you can find it online, it's quite interesting, the top two perceived benefits uh, or the perceived harms, I should say, uh, from local climate change are seen by these uh, science and environmental journalists as being impacts on water resources impacts on ecosystems or forests, and then followed closely by impacts on coastal property and impacts on infrastructure. And then down at the bottom, impacts on the economy, impacts on tourism, recreation, or leisure. So among these environmental journalists, 
they have a very clear idea of what's important. Yeah. So I've got about a, a minute left. So what I see beyond hopelessness, beyond despair, is raising the awareness of the public about climate change. And to that end, I'm working with uh, the organization that produced this study to put on workshops, a workshop uh, coming up in September for journalists, and specifically not science or environmental journalists, because they know the score. So I think the, uh, the effort now should be to try to raise the consciousness of general assignment reporters, people without a science background or without an environmental background or even a major interest in it, and to try to uh, make for them connections between climate change and all the various issues going from uh, impacts on the economy to jobs to weather to ag agriculture, to every aspect of society, to try to bring in the links to climate change to make this a, uh, an area that the public is also making connections in. Because if we don't inform the public, uh, nothing will change. And of course, if we don't get a new administration, a president who does not engage in serial lies, and a government uh, that's for the people and by the people, all the efforts of journalists and scholars and educators will fail. So the ultimate solution, in my mind, is political, is changing who governs our society, because without that, uh, we are on a very bad trajectory right now. And that's the only way I think that ultimate change will happen. <clears throat> Questions, Don Solomon, our Director of Communications, will come to you. It sounds very odd, doesn't it? Um, we'll come to you with the mic. Yes, but bef before Don gets to ask you for a question, I want to ask a question as the, by the powers vested in me as moderator. So I have a couple of hours worth of questions, but I'm going to restrain myself to just one. I wanted to ask about time and the way it complicates the kind of narratives we tell. But instead, I want to ask this panel, and I think we can start with others besides Tom, since he's just, just spoken, about storytelling, about the role of stories. Because this has been a theme since your opening comments last night, Subankar, and also you, Robert. You've both spoken with us about stories and narratives. And that is, of course, the chief ambit of what the humanities do, is provide meaning and structure to human experience. So, which stories work? Jeremy, you suggested that it might be down to anthropomorphizing a bird, to giving, finding meaning in animals, seeing ourselves in the world. And here I think of, uh, actually, of Rachel Carson's three books, her beautiful three books on the sea, which were so personal. They saw themselves and children in the water. Yeah, I think that works. I think that works, and I think it's really important um, but I think storytelling is essential to every aspect of science, even. And if you think about the marketplace of ideas, and I mean, consider the fact that the average scientific paper is never cited. So like the tree that fell in the forest with no people, it basically doesn't exist. And so I think that, that storytelling is fundamental to every aspect of recognition of an idea. And that, um, and that it, it, I think of everything I do as storytelling. I mean, I can describe what happened after that hurricane in terms of data and whatever in, in the way it might be published. But if I tell that story in terms of sort of a sequence and, and sort of a little bit of how we, our opinions changed and all the rest of it, that personalization and storytelling really has an impact in the efficacy of communicating the idea that I'm trying to get across. I think storytelling is essential to absolutely everything I do. Um, I'm not sure that's the answer you were looking for, but, but it's, and you know there's this guy, Randy Olson, who, who uh, has done a lot of criticism of science communication, and then he wrote a book about how to, how to sort of correct that which is titled, Houston, We Have a Narrative. Mm -hmm. And that whole book is about the importance of storytelling mm 
uh, in environmental issues. And um, so scientists tend to go and, 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 and. And what Randy was saying, you know, you can do and, 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 but then you do but, and then you do therefore. And that's what makes a great story, is and, but, therefore. So I think it's central. Stephanie, it's one thing to tell a story about an albatross or a coral reef that I might scuba dive in. But it's another thing to talk about waste and garbage and to tell compelling stories about that. And, and I'm thinking here about, I mean, you've thought really deeply about what stories are and how they work, and I'm thinking of Resilience, your journal. Talk to us about storytelling and about the way it works. Given what you know, I mean, as a, as a literary professor, we've argued about storytelling and its weaknesses for a long time. Um, that, I, no pressure. Um, I will say one of the, one of the things that's been happening to me writing this book is that I'm, I am being pulled in opposite directions between a kind of, um, compulsion to talk about the systems of garbage in a very material way and the, the stories that garbage that are coiled within garbage and their stories that kind of haunt the present and they project into the future but um, one of the ways I've been thinking about storytelling is that this actually does give me a little hope our, our culture is right now obsessed with stories about mm. garbage and so you probably I have a couple chapters in the book about um, hoarders and hoarding and Marie Kondo who is like the world's worst hoarder which is my argument, don't, is that live streaming? Um, and I have been thinking about how our, I am hopeful that people have a sort of obsession right now with telling stories about all possible relationships we can have to the objects that we love and hate and that hurt us and that help us and those are those are two poles about it and you can watch things like antiques roadshow and american pickers and storage wars they're all actually stories about listening to the way that objects structure are um, unconscious right and and they're they're weird but it's actually made me lose my face in stories like i would like to see a version of the marie kondo show that is not here's how amazing your house looks when you get rid of your stuff, but a, but a version of Marie Kondo, which is like, here's where all that stuff that ends up then made you feel really good to get rid of, right? Like there's something about the ease of the stories that we now know how to tell about our objects that is actually inhibiting us mm. from getting mm. to the point of what Jeremy was talking about, mm. how we think about the ways that our culture has asked us to value them and that we use them to value ourselves. So I I mean, as a as a literary critic, I am professionally suspicious of storytelling. And now as a scholar of garbage, I'm I'm now trying to think about what it means that that stories might be garbage. Right, like that, that that storying things might actually be a kind of garbage. Mm. That's. I, I wish that's, I hadn't said that on tape. I know. No, I'm sorry, sorry about that. that. I'm that's sorry about that. For me. I, I took a uh, poll of my seminar uh, yesterday, and there are 14 students, four masters, 10 undergrads, about two thirds of journalism uh, majors or MA students, and. And there's some uh, double major. There are a few double majors, so about half have an environmental studies background. And I asked them, "How many of you think that journalism is part of the solution and uh, something that you would want to do to to try to make the world better?" And disappointingly, only half raised their hand. Mm -hmm. And one of them, kind of one of the seven who raised her hand halfway, was uh, one of my star students, and, and uh, she said, well, you know, uh, in my public policy class, my professor says, forget the journalism, get into government, and change policy. And, and she said, I find that hard to argue with. And I told her, so do I. Because I think that stories that we tell, however gripping they are,
Um, and I just read David Quammen's uh, book, Spillover. I love the book. I read a, uh, the best science and nature stories of 2018, which is tremendous, uh, great stories about environment and other things, uh, science and nature related. The people that those stories are appealing to are not the people whose minds need to change. And so that's the kind of um, audience that I don't have any answer as to how to reach, uh, but I do think the answer is not, I'm not saying storytelling isn't the answer, but storytelling is a very small part of it. But I think political action, as I said earlier, is the key. And maybe through political action you can tell stories. So I started being aware of storytelling in my campaign about the oceans because I felt it was effective for political action. So it wasn't to court journalists. It was really as a, a political action thing. And, and so, you know, in terms of ocean conservation, my all-time favorite organization is called Ocean Champions. They unelect people and replace them with other people, and they're phenomenal. And um, they don't even care about party. They just care about the opinion of it all. So, my little riff on storytelling was actually very apart from that. It was that if I just talk about science the way I might talk to a colleague about the quality of the data, that will engage nobody. Right. But if I talk about it in terms that might be somewhat more gripping, mm -hmm. then it works in that kind of speaker audience context. Yep. Well, I, I agree with you completely. So I wanted to ask a question about indigenous time in a way that that has transformed, for example, environmental history and changed the way environmental humanists think. But instead, I think I'm going to open up to the community, to all of you, and allow Don to circulate the microphone. And I'll ask my question, perhaps of another panel, or if people are quiet. There's Don, and there's, there's a hand. <clears throat> In terms of uh, successful examples of changing human behavior, um, I think we might agree that um, the campaigns to cause us to wear seatbelts and the campaign to stop smoking in restaurants and generally discourage smoking, period, were successful um, because a lot of science was shown and then it became the law. And, and there were many other countries uh, put very nasty images on cigarette packets that showed the inside of lungs. That happens all across Canada. And high schools in, uh, elsewhere in this country put wrecked cars from drunk driving accidents in the front yards. And so it tends to be our preference in, in environmental matters to not sort of be negative and tell you know, nasty stories because people don't like them. But, but when you talk about politics and government and policy and law, uh, I would ask the panel to opine on whether there is an environmental equivalent to what we did to cause seat belts to be worn and people not to smoke in public places at least. So, I mean, that is regulation, right? I mean, the laws are, are regulation. And um, we have had some great successes of regulation. Um, the much maligned EPA, I mean, has uh, done, achieved a lot. Uh, comparable to the stopping of smoking or, or seat belts. But um, it is true that people, shy, uh, a friend of mine, Jennifer Jaquette, wrote a, a book titled Is Shame Necessary? about the use of shame in the environmental movement. The Greenpeace has used it incredibly effectively um, in terms of ocean issues and fisheries. And it was really interesting because the British press loved the book like The Guardian, but the Americans got really upset about the dangerous power of shame and people who might be hurt by shame, and, and the book was a lemon in the United States. It was, it, we, just, we just can't talk about this because it might hurt somebody, which I found gravely disappointing, actually. It, it, so I'm sort of with you. Um, I would have said, though, that another great social movement, extraordinary, that just like happened five years ago, is the whole thing about gay marriage. 
I mean, what a profound social change. And that wasn't about making it, well, eventually it became the law, but the readiness, the ease with which the Obama administration acted was a reflection of this complete flip-flop in public opinion on the issue. I don't know where that came from. It came out of nowhere. It's one of these great miracles that actually occurred. But it wasn't about, you know, that. I think that uh, environment, in my mind, is always local. And so when you talk about planetary degradation, that boggles the mind. And I don't think many people can get their arms around it. I can't. But if you talk about local environmental degradation or destruction, then I think that could be a, uh, a pressure point, uh, telling stories that people in your neighborhood or town can relate to. But the, the problem is that's not enough in my mind. I mean, you, you, need, you need a whole network of smaller communities banded together, perhaps what happened with the, the gay rights movement. Uh, to, to make change happen. But, but if, if I were advising a journalist uh, to where to go, I would say look for the local environmental issue, and that's, that's the point of engagement. But that's starting to go global. Sea level rise is really interesting. I mean, I'm waiting for Mar-a-Lago to have its first full moon high tide, but um, all, over, all over the southeast, mm -hmm. as people's homes are... Are, are being inundated and, and, of course, magnified by storms, those local movements, there are like a dozen of them in Florida, of all these different places that are being affected, and they are starting to come together as a more unified voice, which I believe is going to be really powerful um, by, the, by the time of the next election. I hope so. Stephanie? I haven't gotten beyond despair yet, but I, w I, I do think that um, I do think that some of the things that are working the best and I, are are actually around garbage because it's it's the very it's the very sort of tip of visibility, right? It's really hard to get. It's really hard to give somebody like a nugget of information about, like in a Rob Nixon sort of way, which is like, oh, the slow violence of the poisoning of air and water will work on your body in ways that you will not be able to detect until the very last minute. People are just like, I know, but I just ask you directions to the store, and you're like, no, no, no. But the slow violence of toxic, but, but, um. The things that most people respond to when we're advertising resilience, which we do with some frequency um, on Twitter and Facebook, are we can we can very quickly get new readers by circulating stories of um, you know people complain in the environmental movement about charismatic megafauna, and that's all people care about. But it does a lot of work to show a picture of a whale that is dead and its carcass is full of um, garbage and plastic. That it's horrifying, it's sensationalistic, it's awful, but that may well be the thing that gets people to say single-use plastics probably should be legislated against, right? And there are increasing number of places actually putting that on the bill, but it's the worst, most sensationalistic pictures, right? I mean, I'm sure you see this working in the ocean in, and in studies, like, people don't want to think about, like, the the microbial life, but they will think about like a dolphin named Danny who has it, and that's fine. I mean, as long as it gets people to work on other we things. We were so close to the banning of single-use plastic, actually, until the last election. I mean, it, it, and so the states are doing it. Yeah. I think our cigarette smoking might be food. Yes. In other words, I think there's quite a bit of knowledge, just in general, in the public, about how food is killing us. And the foods that we eat are killing us. There's a big story, I think, maybe on CNN, I saw it maybe somewhere on the news today, about how uh, sodas and too, too much of the wrong kinds of 
foods, processed foods and whatever, are, are, is actually killing more people than cigarette smoking. So I, um, in my own classes, I, I teach about food, food issues. I found that with my students, um, it was much less depressing for them to talk about food um, than to talk about environmentalism and climate change. And so, in fact, in my classes, I don't even really talk that much about climate change. I talk about food. They love to talk about food. They, we watch food movies. We, we talk about every single issue that contributes to, to climate change, but we do it through soil, we do it through plants, we do it through foods, we do it through fertilizer, pesticides, et cetera. And so, and, and health, and human health, um, and also impact on the environment. So we can talk about all of that, but they, they're having a good time. We, we bring food to class, um, and so I think maybe our, our cigarette smoking issue might be food. I, I want to just say quickly, I, super, I, I think that is an excellent insight, and I completely agree with it. And I think it actually gets to what people on the panel were talking about and that has been talked about um, during this conference, which is that that's a, that is something you can really easily make local. Like, I live in West Virginia right now, and um, West Virginia is mostly a food desert, and, like, people really care about that. They care about what constitutes a food desert, how, what is food scarcity. And so it's a huge, I, I agree with you, it's a huge thing, and they care about it, but they will also, they're also willing to talk about the sort of local manifestations, because they know, they know, or they themselves, their families, are, are hungry, you know? It, it, I think you're right about food being the signal. And food waste. It's a massive. And the energy inefficiency yeah. of industrial agriculture, which is stunning. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just and totally unnecessary. And you mentioned desert. Uh, the other desert that's really important are news deserts. And uh, with every passing week, another local uh, news organization, usually a local paper, goes under. And so to reach the people who may be living in, in West Virginia, if they don't have a local news organization, then you can't tell those local stories I was talking about. Uh, and not everybody's online. And so that is, that is a huge problem. There are new models that are starting, uh, basically uh, nonprofit news organizations that are springing up in, in some areas. But because of the uh, corporate takeover of news media, uh, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle on, on that end. And, and local news newspapers that are alive, many of them are very successful. They just don't make the profit margins that if a uh, uh, corporation goes uh, public, uh, they're not getting the, the revenue streams and the profit margins that shareholders want. So that's, that's a big problem. Thank you. Getting back to this, all children go to school. And children, we haven't talked about children here, they get to their parents. And uh, when I was doing the Polar Project, the children were complaining about their parents not being aware enough about what they were doing. And um, the children learn a lot in school, and it's very, very difficult for them often to have these discussions with their parents. And this movement we were talking about yesterday of all these young people now on the streets um, when uh, I had this six-month polar project after working in the Arctic and Antarctic, uh, I worked in McDougall Middle School in Cobra Chapel Hill, and um, I went very carefully and did not use difficult language. I think language, the, the use of language, the use of certain things is really important, getting back to your point. And the main thing was not to frighten children about what was in their future, but to make them stakeholders of their future. And so we made all sorts of sculptures of animals, of polar animals, Inuit suits, and things like that. And this gradually uh, grew into a greater awareness of some of the issues that are facing you know, us in the middle latitudes generated by polar issues. And by the end of six months, these, these children had enough confidence to face the future because they had actually made some of these creations. And 
they could even you know, have, take these things home. And to this very day, I, in the community, a lot of the parents keep coming up to me and say, you know, we still have those penguins. This was 10 years ago. These kids made these big, big sculptures and took them home. And they're still in the houses. So these children are now 22, 24. We did not approach it from a very dangerous linguistic problem. We did it through art. We did it through creation. We did it through positive uh, discussions about what you're going to make and looking how many types of penguins and this kind of thing. So it's really important to engage students, uh, children and to give them the respect because they are the inheriting this planet and we need to involve them at a very young age. I guess I'd just like to say I, I totally agree with you. I, I'm teaching a sort of out of the curriculum environmental education program in Brooksville, Maine, where I live most of the time. And parents are now coming up to me and saying, you told my child such and such. And I say, yes, I did. You know? But um, I don't know. I think it's having, it makes me feel good. But I think actually they are sort of hungry because their parents are, are Mainers. They're very much stuck in the old ways. And they're slightly frightened because they can see that the old way is not the future. And so I think most of them are actually listening, and I hope so, because they're facing enormous challenges there. And that is the story of everything is local. And, but no, I, I agree. She wants to ask a question. Yeah, give me the microphone. Um, I have a question that's also about teaching um, and builds on the last couple of questions, I think. Um, I live in Philadelphia, and I usually teach um, college and graduate students. This semester, though, I'm teaching a special class for 12 um, school teachers in the Philadelphia School District. And I wanted to do that because of the kids, right? But I also wanted to do it as an experiment in what does it mean when you talk about the environment and environmental humanities with children with teachers who don't think of themselves as environmentalists or in fact think that they don't live in a place that's environmental. Even though, of course, we're in, I mean, obviously we're in the environment, but they live often on the edges of brownfields or they live in environmental justice communities, places that are not um, beautiful. Um, and the teachers have said, um, my students, the, the, these are concerns that are, they, we don't know how to translate them. We don't know food deserts being one way to talk about it, news deserts being another. Um, but I wanted to ask um, the, the minds gathered here about when we think about how to tell stories or make things that pluralize the environment and what we mean by that so that it's not a concern of wealthy white people, um, what are practices that you find effective in your own work? If, if I can answer that, uh, I've come to the realization that, that fact-based stories, which are the bread and butter of journalists, do not engage, these are college students and graduate students, as much as essays. And so the assignment that, that I've found most excites students is when uh, I give a 900-word assignment for an essay, and then we read several other essays uh, where voice is really key. So to try to bring out the individual's voice on an environmental issue through an essay, I think that's the kind of uh, heart connection that uh, many of us have been talking about. I, I find that's a really useful device. I don't know if that be, if that may be. Uh, your age group may be too young, or the teachers who teach those students would be too young. But I, I think that's a, a, a great uh, tool, an outlet. For me, I, you know, I live on the coast and sea level rises there. The, we, the last um, field trip we did, because I love to go outdoors with them, is we went, um, the turnoff to the road that goes to my house is two feet above high tide. And a year ago, there was a big storm, and the road was slightly underwater. So we talked a little bit about climate change and everything. I said, why don't we just go on a field trip to think about climate change in Brooksville? You know, I mean, is this real? 
I mean, what do you think? So we went to this place, and we, we stopped for about 45 minutes. And, and, and the long and the short of it was that um, they came to the conclusion that somebody was going to have to build a bridge so that people could get to my house. And so I just sort of let them do it, right, and get there. And then the principal who came along said, well, first they asked me, I asked them, what, how much do you think it would cost to build a bridge? Well, my brother's an engineer, so he had told me that that little bridge for this little problem in this little broke place in Maine was going to cost at least half a million dollars. And then the principal pointed out to them that the school budget was a million dollars a year. And it was like that. Because, you know, people are going to have to get home. So for me, because I'm thinking about environmental stuff, it's very powerful to go out on field trips of mutual discovery. Because they're not stupid. I mean, they, they, been th they, they had observed things I had not seen. Stephanie, I want to give you the chance to have the second to last word. Oh, you Hi, thank you. Um, that is a hard question and a great question. And um, I often talk to people who say, um, even teaching classes in environmental humanities, I am not in a, it's, it's like in the 80s when people are like, I'm not a feminist. And you're like, do you believe in equal pay for equal work? Well, congratulations. Welcome to the club. And people will say, I'm not an environmentalist. And what it turns out they mean is, I don't like to go hiking. Well, I don't, I don't like to go hiking that much either, you know? Um, and so I really feel like the first thing is to like basically re, re signify that word. It's like, does the world you live in promote the flourishing of all life, right? And the answer is always no, of course it doesn't. But it is even easier to do with objects. Like you can ask somebody to pull a piece of garbage out of their garbage can, which I often do with students, and to narrate um, all of the different bodies that had to touch this thing, right? And which of those bodies flourished by touching it and which of them didn't, right? If the object made someone else into an object, they are now, and they see that, they're now an environmentalist, and it's kind of a great thing. Um, and then it's horrifying because they don't ever want to touch anything, but I haven't dealt with that part of this equation yet, so I'm still working on that, but it is, it's a hard question. So I just want to make an observation about that question from Bethany Wigan and Joni Adamson's question and the question about smoking. Um, it seems to me so interesting that our panel has come around to storytelling and to teaching that so many of the questions were about teaching. And I think it's worth remembering, I'm, think, I'm looking around this room and I'm thinking about how many of you are teachers. And it's worth remembering that um, while we wish that our writings would reach lots and lots of people, our teaching does reach lots and lots of people. And if we're honest with ourselves, and I hope we are, our real impact for most of us is in our classrooms, not in the writing we do. And that is a tremendous obligation and opportunity. And I, I want to remind all of us as we think about the kind of stories we tell, whether those are apocalyptic stories or they're stories that people can enter, as Joni mentioned about food, that if we crush students with complexity and shame, if we use the facts, or in my discipline, the past, to club people with in the present, we miss the chance that we were given to be inspired. Because classrooms for young people, and that goes, I'm going to include myself even in that category today at the Duke Farm, classrooms are the chance to be inspired. And let's remember that. That's what I see underneath the questions you asked. How do we tell stories that are inspiring to people even as they are truthful and acknowledge the severity of the crises we have? And that is where I'm hoping more of our conversations will go after this panel. So our time is up, but thank you to these wonderful panelists and for the, the questions as well.